Thank you. So, so what I want to do today is talk about an idea that is both familiar in the history of political philosophy and also in certain ways puzzling, that is, the idea of the people giving laws to themselves. I gave a slight preview of today's lecture in response to several questions yesterday, and I'm going to give a little bit of a review of what I talked about yesterday in order to fill out that preview, and then I will give a more developed account. But the idea that the people give their laws to themselves has a long history in democratic theory, has a long history in political philosophy, and it's an uplifting kind of idea because, of course, it holds forth at least the promise of a system in which, as Rousseau puts it, nobody obeys anyone other than themselves. That's a very uplifting idea. But, of course, it is also a puzzling idea. Part of what makes it puzzling is that, insofar as it is obedience, it's not really clear, again, Kant tries to finesse this in the groundwork, but the way in which you are obeying and giving the same law is not always entirely clear. But in the groundwork, however exactly that works, that's not going to be our concern today. Because in political society, the idea that you're obeying laws that you have given to yourself or that the peoples have given to themselves is mediated by the fact that the giving of those laws is, of course, public, general, and institutional. And so it's not just some kind of way of explaining the relation between your law-giving will and your being subject to the legislation. It's mediated by public legal institutions. If in a modern democracy you give laws to yourself, you do that every few years by voting. And how that could be an instance of giving laws to yourself is, of course, a deeply puzzling question. So <clears throat> let me give you just a very brief reminder of the ground that I covered yesterday. The basic idea yesterday is that the way in which we can understand how, sorry, the basic problem that I sought to address yesterday was the problem of how it is that public legal institutions can have the kinds of powers that they do, which are powers that no private person could have. How is it that they are allowed to impose binding resolution on disputes? How is it that they are allowed to collect taxes? How is it that, that they are entitled to set up define and enforce various systems of mandatory cooperation, everything from health insurance to traffic rules, how can they do all of these things in a way that is consistent with each person's status as a free being, as a being that is, has no natural superior over them and so is not the natural subordinate of anyone. Given that no private person can do these kinds of things, no private person can compel someone to participate in a cooperative arrangement, even if that cooperative arrangement is very much to the benefit of the person being so compelled. Instead, a public authority has powers that are distinctive. Further, those powers are, as I noted yesterday, often aggregative, that is, in making a hard decision between one course of action and another, the public authority has no way of avoiding considering how that is, is going to affect different groups of people and it is going to affect them differently and has to take account of those things. These are things no private person can do and the question is, how can this be consistent with everyone's status as a free being, as someone who is not subject to the determining choice of another? My answer had two parts. The first part involved the concept of an omnilateral will. The idea of an omnilateral will is the idea of a will that is not anybody in particular's private will. The omnilateral will has only the purpose of providing a rightful condition in which everyone can enjoy their freedom together. That then raised the question of how the idea of an omnilateral will can be instantiated, 
And my answer was that it can be instantiated through a system of public offices where the defining feature of a public office is that it has a specific mandate. To have a specific mandate is to be charged with answering some question in particular subject to a specific characterization of the grounds that may and the grounds that may not be considered. Public officials are not allowed to directly decide this is going to, on balance, promote the existence of a public legal order. They are rather, we're always working within defined mandates. That then requires a further characterization, which I gave briefly yesterday, of the way in which mandates are defined. And the basic picture is that mandates are delegated from a higher level to a lower level. This then provoked a series of questions yesterday, the first of which came from Marcus Vilascheck, about how exactly it is that these things get defined, since having seen the title of today's lecture, he knew the answer was going to be democratically, but there was a conceptual question about how this was to be understood in relation to the structure of my characterization of the public as a system of offices. So. Let me begin by doing just that. I said a little bit th about this yesterday. I'm going to begin with a kind of pithy summary that will build on an exchange I had with Luigi Caranti, who many of you know because he was here last term. Luigi pu published an excellent pa paper in Kantian Review last year on Kant's criticism of Athenian democracy. And so, I read a lot of stuff. I always save PDFs of things that I read. But finding back where this great argument was is not always easy. And so I always give my PDFs titles that have three words in addition to the title of the paper that summarize the paper. And so I don't normally divulge to authors or to anyone what my three words are. But I told Luigi. The summary of your paper, the critic Kant's criticism of Athenian democracy, no job description. The problem Kant sees with Athenian democracy is that it has an unlimited, and again, putting to one side whether he's correct in his characterization of Athenian democracy, is that it has an unlimited mandate. Voters are allowed to decide anything, the majority can decide, as Kant puts it, against the one. That is, there's no picture of any kind of limit of right on the power of, of a majority to decide things. Now, the obvious alternative to this, implicit in this Kantian characterization of what's wrong with Athenian democracy, is a characterization of democracy and a characterization of the way in which the people can give laws to themselves that is itself structured by a job description. What is the job description? I gave a brief description of it yesterday. I'll give the brief description again now, and then I will fill it out in much more detail. The basic thought that I will put forward is that the process of voting is itself a fundamental public office. In deciding who to vote for, or in the case of something like a referendum, what to vote for, the person who is exercising the, the official power has the mandate of making a determination in terms of the requirements of the public legal order rather than on the basis of any kind of private purpose. Now, that's a summary of the picture, and you, so you will be able to see where I'm going at every step of my development of the picture. Let me now fill it out in more detail. I want to, as a way of framing the issue, emphasize something that is fundamental to any Kantian understanding of the question of democracy, the question of people giving laws to themselves, by contrasting it 
with two other kinds of two other ways in which we might think of the people giving laws to themselves, one of which sometimes shows up in Kant's writing, but is not his full picture, and the other of which does not show up in Kant's writing, but shows up in a lot of other democratic theory. And the true Kantian picture needs to find a path between these. So the first thing with which I want to contrast the account that I'm going to give is the idea of hypothetical consent. The idea that laws are properly public if they are, as Kant puts it, in what is enlightenment, and he re repeats this in on the common saying and repeats it again in the doctrine of right, that the ruler cannot give a law that the people could not give to itself. Kant uses this argument against ecclesiastical constitutions. He uses it against hereditary nobilities and titles. And the basic thought is a sound one, but is not yet an idea of people giving laws to themselves. Yesterday, I mentioned that on a Kantian view, because of more general Kantian principles that are run through his theoretical as well as the practical philosophy, a kind of priority attaches to the possible over the actual. The critique of pure reason is, a, is focused on the question of the structure of possible experience. And then in his discussion in the analytic of principles in the postulates, he explains that actuality is just a specific determination of possibility. So too here, in the case of law giving, the outer limit of possible rightful law giving are laws that a people could give to itself. What laws could a people not give to itself? In some sense, a people could not give itself laws that are inconsistent with the possibility of being in a rightful condition. And so just to stick to the examples from yesterday, a people could not give itself laws that established an official with unlimited prerogative powers. A people could not give itself an absolute monarch, could not give itself a Hobbesian sovereign, could not create a public office that had rights but no duties. Now, what's the modality of that word could? The answer is could not rightfully do so. That is, it's not that it is, as it were, empirically impossible to do this. People have done all kinds of foolish things, and they presumably could do all kinds of foolish things again. The fundamental point, about which I will say a little bit more later on, is that the question of the laws that people could give themselves is a question of which laws are consistent with their status as free and independent beings. And in so doing, they could give themselves a ruler, but they could not give themselves an overlord or a master. And so possible agreement, fundamental as the outer boundary of rightful law giving. And again, if you think about this structure in relation to modern post-World War II constitutions, such as the constitutions of Canada and Germany, you get the exact same structure. This is a structure that characterizes the limits of government lawmaking power, but it does not characterize the exercise of that power within those limits. It's a characterization of what it would be for something to be consistent with a rightful condition in which everyone is free without it being a characterization of all of the laws. Once again, just to pick up on something I said yesterday, the Kantian philosophy does not purport to have philosophy answer every possible practical question. It instead gives a characterization of the grounds on which practical questions can be answered, and then it is our job 
to answer them. Now, so hypothetical consent is too weak. It's too weak because it is not actually a picture of actual law giving. Let me just make this point in one more way. If you think about other cases of con in which we think of consent as morally significant, I could consent to sell you my bicycle for one euro. That is within my rightful power. But of course, that doesn't mean that you can take my bicycle and give me a euro because I need to have actually consented. Possible consent is important because something to which I could not possibly consent is necessarily wrongful. Nonetheless, whether I have actually consented makes a difference. So we want something stronger than possible consent. The obvious candidate, which runs through Lockean political philosophy, runs through, I'm sorry to say, most North American democratic theory, focuses instead on actual consent understood empirically. And indeed, yesterday I mentioned Nico Kolodny's book, The Pecking Order. He seems to think that the difficulty that arises from hierarchical institutions can be repaired somewhat, his word is tempered, by making sure that people have an input. Giving them an input doesn't make it not be hierarchical, but it somehow makes it less bad, where that input is just a matter of their own particular, to use the Kantian idiom, matter of choice. So I want to just talk about why that can't be the right way to think about the idea of giving laws to ourselves. I'm going to try and put this in general terms, so I will occasionally find myself being more narrowly Kantian in expressing it. The difficulty with an empirical idea of consent, or the difficulties, are multiple. The first difficulty is that it is very difficult when you have a large group of people to say that they have, in fact, all consented. If you have electoral politics, there is virtually never a unanimous outcome. And so the question of whether everyone has consented already looks like a problem. So that, is, that we might describe as the merely pragmatic problem. I was going to call it the merely practical problem, but practical has a special Kantian meaning, but so does pragmatic, and so we're not going to get away from that. But the merely empirical problem, unrealizable. But there are also moral and conceptual problems. The first of these is that there are, as it were, two versions of consent in private right. One is where, for example, you consent to have somebody perform surgery on you, cut your hair, or you assume the risk when they take you on their paraglider. That kind of consent is transactional and episodic. The difficulty with that as a model of popular rule, of course, is that that kind of transactional and episodic consent can always be withdrawn. You can change your mind. Not a good idea generally halfway through your haircut to tell your stylist to stop because it's likely to come out not looking very good. Then again, depends just how bad a job the stylist is doing. But normatively, of course you can do that. Again, when you're on my paraglider, there's a limit to how quickly I can act on your withdrawal of consent, but it is entirely up to you. You get more enduring consent by contract. I can agree and create an obligation that I will cut your lawn next Wednesday, out of which I cannot unilaterally back. But notice, that's not going to be the right model either. Two difficulties with it as the model. The first difficulty is that 
It is merely material. It depends on my particular ends. The second difficulty is that it looks like it's not going to generate the right kind of picture of a group of people giving laws to themselves. Because whenever you have a contractual relation, it is a relation between the choice of one person and the choice of another person. It's bilateral. But it seems that if you try to imagine a large group of people all agreeing, we have to ask, with whom are they making this agreement? Who is the counterparty? And again, so if everyone who is on the ski hill has signed the same waiver, they all have made an agreement with the ski hill operator, and they haven't engaged in any kind of moral relationship with each other. It's merely parallel, and so it doesn't look like it's any kind of candidate for lawgiving. Now, all of these difficulties are expressions of the fact that the idea of empirical consent or empirical contract are themselves private legal ideas. And the fundamental point that Kant makes in his discussion of private right is there can be no binding private legal ideas without public right. But in addition to that merely textual point about the Kantian argument, there is a more general philosophical argument that tells us that the public could only be consistent with everyone's freedom if it is non-private, if it is not dependent on private purposes. But notice that if we go with something like empirical consent, then it is always going to be dependent on private purposes. And so it's going to fail to constitute a properly public legal order. Now, having gone through hypothetical consent and actual consent, you might wonder whether I have, as it were, exhausted the possibilities and whether I should just stop now and say, no, we can't give laws to ourselves after all. I'm pleased to report, though you may be disappointed, that they do not, in fact, exhaust the possibilities. Here's a way of thinking about the nature of the question that we have to ask. And once we see what that question is, we see its philosophical structure. It's not an empirical question. And we can't talk, fond as I am of so doing, about the people nominally consenting. Because what we need is an explanation not of how somehow something else is going on. We need an explanation of how it is that ordinary politics, with all of its flaws and all of its passions and all of its anger, could be in any way related to the idea of people giving laws to themselves. But now notice that is a question from a Kantian point of view that has the structure of explaining a synthetic principle. How it is that this thing, people campaigning, people voting, people counting ballots, can have a bearing on the obligations of other people and how it is that can be sufficiently reflexive such that the people who do the voting are thereby bound by the results of it. So if that is the structure, it is, of course, not a merely abstract ideal question. It is not a merely empirical question, but rather, in Kantian terms, a transcendental question. So, Let's come back to yesterday's model of what it is for something to be properly public as focused in terms of the idea of a public office with a mandate. I said yesterday that a public office has a mandate that describes the question that the official is charged with answering. 
the grounds on which the official is to decide it. I described that yesterday as the answer to the what question. But I noted that yesterday at the beginning I had, in addition to the what question, articulated what I called the who question. That is, who is it that decides? You will remember that my, among my opening examples was that elections are contested precisely because everybody realizes that who is elected will make a difference to the decision that is made. Implicit in that characterization was something that I mentioned only briefly yesterday, but is of first importance to today's topic. That is, every public office, as well as having a mandate, must in addition have a mode of appointment and a mode of oversight. It has to have a mode of appointment because the artificial or moral person that is the state can only act through natural persons, but it can only do that by acting through particular natural persons. If you have differentiated offices, then plainly different offices have to be filled by different particular natural persons. And so there has to be a way not merely of saying this is the office decide, charged with deciding this question, but also this is the official who occupies that office. But further, there has to be a way of making sure that each official acts properly within their own mandate. And so there has to be a structure of oversight whereby there is some other office that is charged with making sure that each occupant of the particular office is, in fact, acting within their mandate. And so there has to be a method of appointment and at least potentially a method of removal if failing to do the job. So I think you can see where this is going. Because, of course, with respect to the civil service, we have a whole bureaucracy charged with hiring people into various official positions. Well, who hires them? And the answer is, well, people hire up. And who hires them? People hire up. And eventually, we get to the legislature, which is charged with defining different offices, defining the mandates of the dif different offices, and articulating the general laws in pursu pursuant to which each of those offices exercises its powers. But once we get to the highest level, which is the legislature, we then have officials who are overseeing a system of offices, and then we go one level up. Democra electoral democracy is a way in which the oversight of the legislature and in systems where there's a separate election of the executive, the oversight of the executive is done by yet a higher office. What's the higher office? The higher office is the office of the voters. Now notice that the role of a voter has the structure of an office as I had characterized it yesterday. Let me illustrate this with a small scale example, an example that is unfortunately vivid for me because I'm currently an academic administrator. So at North American universities, academic administrators are appointed by committees. And if you're on a committee charged with selecting an academic administrator, on the one hand, you're just a member of the department. And on the other hand, of course, you are acting in an official capacity. So what are you supposed to do? How do you decide between the potential candidates? Well, certain parts of it are really easy. Like the easy part is if anyone wants the job, then probably they're not suitable. The, I, I, that's, though, particular to philosophy, because as we know from Plato's 
public, the philosopher needs to be compelled to rule, whereas in other kinds of departments, people are kind of climbing over each other trying to get the position. But notice, you find, you have to ask certain kinds of questions. You ask, how will this person run the department? So you have to ask about their kind of managerial competence. You have to ask about their priorities. You have to ask about their judgment. And you have to ask about their integrity. Will they just hire their friends? Will they play favorites? Or will they take their job seriously? You have imperfect information about all of these things. But notice, those are the things you're supposed to consider. Here's something that you're not supposed to consider. You're not allowed, for example, to say, well, this person wouldn't really be very good for the job, but if they're the department head, then they're not going to have time for teaching, and so that means I'll get to teach my favorite course because they won't be competing with me for it. That's not appropriate. So we can draw this distinction between appropriate and inappropriate kinds of grounds. Notice that if we do that, we have characterized committee charged with choosing someone as an office in exactly the way in which public offices operate. Now, scale this up to democracy, and it turns out that it is both harder and more complicated because there are so many more factors. But you still have the exact same structure. You have a mandate. The first part of your mandate is to make sure you're getting someone who is competent. We live in a world in which candidates announce their platforms in advance. You have to figure out what to make of their platform. You have to estimate the likelihood of them actually successfully carrying out their platform. Someone tells you that they are going to cut taxes and raise government spending, then you might want to investigate further as to how they exactly propose to do this. And you need to figure out whether they are going to not to succeed, but stick to what they said they were going to do. But notice that all of those things are things that are, in a certain sense, completely straightforward for you. They're not straightforward in the sense that you don't need to exercise judgment. They're not straightforward in the sense that you know exactly how much significance to attach to one rather than another. You have a candidate with high integrity and low competence. What are you and going against a candidate with high competence and low integrity? What do you do? You need to figure it out. But now notice, if you're doing that, then you are acting in an official capacity. As you act in an official capacity, the pathology of official capacities, that is the risk of corruption, is always present. And so you do not, just as you do not vote for the candidate for department head who's going to be released from teaching and thus let you teach your favorite course, so you don't vote for the candidate for public office who is going to cut taxes in a way that favors you personally. We can draw a distinction between the public standpoint that is proper to the office and the merely private standpoint. So now, notice something else about this. Although there is a, a strict analogy between the small-scale case and the large-scale case in terms of their form, that is, in terms of the difference between acting within and acting beyond the mandate, there's also one fundamental difference. That is, while you are acting in your purely public capacity as voter, you are subject to the mo most general requirements of public right rather than, for example, the purposes of the university or the purposes of your academic performance, uh, department. So Kant talks briefly about the distribution of offices in the general remark to public right, 
His discussion is largely focused on the question of whether there could be a hereditary nobility with official powers. And although that discussion is put entirely in terms of possible agreement, he says the people could not throw away their freedom in this way, it gives us, as I will now explain, an understanding of what it is to have a proper mode of appointment. So when Kant says that the people could not throw away their freedom in this way, he does not say that it would not be to their advantage. It's rather that it would be inconsistent with freedom. And then he says something that seems quite puzzling. He says, suitability for office is not the kind of thing that could be inherited. Now, is he saying that abilities are not genetic in any way? Doesn't seem like the kind of claim he would want to be making in the metaphysics of morals, which is supposed to be an a priori system. But more than that, when Kant talks about inheritance, he is not talking about biology. Indeed, whenever Kant uses biological vocabulary outside of explicit discussions of biology, he's actually using juridical vocabulary. And the sense in which suitability for office cannot be inherited is that suitability for office cannot be bequeathed. Why can suitability for office not be bequeathed? Because it's inconsistent with the public character of an office to have the holder of the office have unlimited discretion with respect to the appointment of that person's success to the office. But notice, having it be inherited as bequeathed in a will is just that, even if there is an understanding that it will go, for example, to the eldest male son. Instead, the only way that someone can be selected for an office is on the basis of their suitability for the office, as understood in terms of the mandate of the office. So your job as a voter is to choose the suitable purpose for the office based on your understanding of their suitability to meeting the mandate of the office. Now, I've characterized the way in which voting functions as people giving laws to themselves in terms of the function of the voter. It remains for me to do two further things. The first thing I need to do is show how that amounts to the people giving laws to themselves. But the second thing I have to do is explain the way in which, having characterized it in, broadly speaking, functional terms, this is a function that can only properly lie with the people. Because notice, I've given a kind of iterative argument, or regress argument, that says the lower level decision makers is selected by the higher level, by the higher level, by the higher level, every level needs a level of oversight, needs an appointment procedure, and I've said, and the series terminates in the united will of all, in the voters. But you might say, well, why, doesn't the ser why can't the series terminate in some other way, in some other place? Why couldn't we have something else charged with appointment and oversight? Why couldn't we have a panel of experts charged with appointment and oversight? You look at some of the politicians elected around the world today, you might think that the voters are not necessarily doing the best imaginable job of that. Or you might think that this is Rousseau's view in the social contract. He has this figure of the legislator who comes in, deus ex machina, solves the problem of studying the people, choosing what the appropriate laws are for them, and then 
gives the laws to them, and then the people just, the legislators just vote on their implementation. So imagine a variant on the Rousseauian picture, whereby we don't have the outside legislator figuring as the giver of the laws. We have that done by the highest level, the legislature, within the system. But we nonetheless have someone from outside the system step in and supervise. Make sure that the right people are appointed. You have a kind of trusteeship. And indeed, if you think, obviously, that this is a loaded example, which is meant to make you see what's wrong with it, but various colonial powers used to appoint local assemblies and give the local assemblies a certain kind of power over things, but the, the local assembly served entirely at the pleasure of the outside colonial power. Now, in terms of solving the, as it were, terminate the regress problem, this looks like it might be successful, but it is nonetheless plainly defective. Why is it defective? Because notice that if you have an outside power, whether it is from another country or from the Rousseauian lawgiver from outside, or to use an example Reiner Forst has discussed in the past, where you just have a computer program that's really, really good at this, functionally, you might get, you might probably would not actually get, but we can conceive of a system in which you get exactly the same laws or the exactly the same members of the legislative assembly chosen. What would be wrong with that? Here's what would be wrong with it, which is also going to answer the question of how this counts as the people giving laws to themselves. So imagine that we have this legislator, legislature appointed however it is that it is mysteriously appointed. and the members of the legislature are charged with making laws. They make laws of general application, which is to say the laws apply to them too. So notice that the members of the legislature give laws to themselves and to everyone else. But they stand in a different relation to those laws than everyone else does. They give the laws to themselves. Why? Because they participate in the process of exercising judgment about what those laws should be in a way in which creates a novel relation between them and ordinary citizens. The problem with that is not that it is necessarily a form of domination, but rather that this form of asymmetry renders the ordinary citizens passive and them and the legislatures active. But notice, if the citizens as a collective body are the ones who choose the legislators, then everyone is active. The only distinctive powers enjoyed by some that are not enjoyed by all are delegated powers, powers that are delegated by everyone through their participation in the making, in, I'm sorry, in the selection of officials. But that means everyone is a public official and then exercising the plenary power of public officials is just choosing who will exercise the delegated powers. But that means that they are ruling themselves through their representatives. They haven't consented to the particular laws, but they are not ruled by anyone other than themselves. Now, this might seem, how to put it, a not completely realistic picture of contemporary politics. Plainly, politics is messy. And of course, it is a familiar criticism of Kantian views of just about everything, 
to say that Kant wants everything to be tidier and, and more abstract and more a priori. And how are we to understand this as really reflecting the kinds of democracies we find ourselves in and that we see around the world, all of which are cursed with the various forms of money in politics, single issue voting, demagoguery, and populism. Notice that each of those things is something that is genuinely a problem, and the Kantian account lets us understand what is problematic about each of them as a problem. Let me say something about each. The problem of money in politics is the problem that money in politics is a principle of private choice. It is an attempt to get people to vote the, in particular ways based on the interests of those who can afford to try to influence them. It's not always successful, but it gets its point from the possibility of corruption. So too with demagoguery. So too with the idea of a single issue voter. Single issue voters are distressingly common. And the problem with a single issue voter is that a single issue voter is failing to do what they are supposed to do as a voter. If there are multiple challenges facing a society, it can't be that just one of them should be decisive. And so, again, these are cases in which someone is failing to do their job. What about populism? Lots has been written about populism, and I won't attempt to even scratch the surface of that literature, only to note that the principle of populism is just the principle of collective private choice. It is the idea, as that former U.S. Supreme Court nominee Robert Bork famously put it, that majorities are allowed to rule simply because they are majorities. That's a principle of private choice, not a principle of public right. There's a limit to how much philosophy can do to stop that. Yesterday, I talked about corruption as the fundamental wrong that is characteristic and brings into focus the fundamental structure of public right. Public right exists when people act for properly public purposes. We can understand it through contrast with corruption, where people act for improper which is to say private purposes. What I've done today is given a characterization of democracy and of the way in which the people can rule themselves through their laws and institutions that once again can be brought into focus through a contrast. Because of course, populism, demagoguery, the curse of money, single issue voting, these are all corruptions of democracy. Philosophy can only do so much to prevent these things, but at the same time, philosophy can help us to understand them and can help us understand what's wrong with them. And finally, what's wrong with them is that they're private rather than public uses of public power. They subordinate the public to private purposes. What I've tried to do both yesterday and today is articulate an idea of the public that lets us understand how it can be anything other than that. How we can understand the institutions in which we find ourselves, however complicated, messy, and indeed flawed they may be, as instances of a public in which people genuinely give laws to themselves. Thank you.